Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. All right, welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Michael Brown in Langley, British Columbia. This is Matthew Stockton <laughs> in Vancouver, who's finally figured out how to turn on the correct microphone. This is take four. <laughs> oh, boy. But we're having fun. I mean, it's just things happen. Matthew's still learning. Matthew's not a pro anything. Neither am I, to tell you the truth. But you know what? We're still learning. We're st it's fine. We're still learning. And I had the microphone set up this morning, but then I started blaring ABBA all morning, and I think I shut it right. off. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's probably exactly what you did. Yeah. So this October, in a rare cosmic alignment, we're gifted with not four, but five Mondays. And you know what that means for all you devoted Dark Poutine listeners out there? Five delicious servings of the show specifically curated for the spookiest month of the year. And we're calling the series Spooktober. From haunted locales to chilling urban legends and strange occurrences that'll make your skin crawl, we've got it all lined up for you. And don't worry, we've even got a crazy, scary, and bizarre true crime story for our sixth anniversary show that drops on October 30th. So strap in, folks. Great. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Patin podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Canada, being the second largest country in the world, is a vast land of dense forests, expansive tundras, and rugged coastlines. Our diverse landscapes are home to folklore, legends, and tales of mysterious creatures. These elusive beings have captured the imaginations of locals, researchers, and enthusiasts for generations. In this, the first of five spookier-themed episodes for October, let's explore a few of Canada's most intriguing, legendary creatures. We'll learn about a weird giant frog in Coleman, New Brunswick, a mythical people-eating creature in British Columbia, grumpy fairies in Quebec, and a few mythical and often terrifying creatures from the indigenous lore of Canada's north. This is Dark Poutine episode 287, Spooktober, more legendary Canadian creatures. Diving into the vast world of Canadian folklore is one of my favorite topics. If you've been tuning in, you'll remember our episodes on the elusive Ogopogo, that mysterious creature lurking in the depths of Okanagan Lake, and our look at Sasquatch sightings in the dense forests of British Columbia. 
And who could forget our spine-tingling episode on the Lougarou, Canada's very own werewolf legend, which has its roots in French-Canadian folklore and has been haunting the imaginations of many for generations. These episodes were a blast. But Canada's legends don't stop there. Our history is teeming with tales that span from the ancient oral traditions of indigenous peoples to the more modern urban legends that still send shivers down our spines. Remember when we covered the Flying Canoe or the Chasse Galerie? Well, that story of lumberjacks making a pact with the devil to visit their loved ones was a haunting blend of the supernatural and the struggles of colonial life. What fascinates me most about these tales and why I love sharing them with you all is how they reflect the broader themes of survival, coexistence, and adaptation in the huge and challenging Canadian landscape. Whether it's the deep respect for nature seen in many indigenous legends or the tales of conquest from colonial times, there's a story from every corner of this great land. The majority of Canadians live near the southern border with the United States, and this is because the climate is milder and the land is more suitable for agriculture, infrastructure, and urban development. Major cities like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary, and Ottawa are all located in this southern belt. Approximately 80% of Canadians live in urban areas, meaning a significant portion of the country's land area is sparsely populated or even uninhabited. The far north regions, including parts of the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, are characterized by tundra and Arctic conditions. While these areas are habitable, and indeed are inhabited by indigenous communities and other residents, the harsh climate and remote nature make large-scale habitation challenging. Indeed. And I think we've spoken about this before on the show, mm -hmm. how Canadian culture owes a lot to our climate. Yes. It's actually a significant part of, of who we are and the stories we tell. Yeah. There's this great book. Back in 2009, Michael Adams wrote this super insightful book that pretty much called the shots on how Canada and the U.S. were going to diverge socially, which I think we've really seen in the past decade. Mm-hmm. The book's title was Fire and Ice, Canada, the United States, and the Myth of Converging Values. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there's this one chapter in the book where he talks about how Americans are more like homesteaders, while Canadians are more leaning towards being fort people. They're the homesteader are out there on their own versus Canadians that created forts, right? And mm -hmm. all of this is linked to our natural environment, right? Our surroundings shape our way of thinking and how we relate to each other. We had to sort of learn to survive together, which led to us having close-knit communities and a knack for acceptance of others and their differences. You know, in Canada, we talk about cultural mosaic versus melting pot, right? And it's, it's a way of getting along. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for some really good reads, because I've, I've mentioned this author before, Canadian readers, or anyone else who, who wants to understand what it means to be a Canadian, he wrote three other books that are, the titles are fantastic. So the first one is, that I'll recommend is Sex in the Snow. <laughs> The Surprising Revolution of Canadian Social Values. Another one is called Unlikely Utopia, The Surprising Triumph of Canadian Pluralism. And of course, his most recent one, Could It Happen Here, Canada in the Age of Trump and Brexit. So these are all definitely worth taking a look if you want to do a little bit of study on what it means to be Canadian. Yeah, sure. I'm sort of still fixated on sex in the snow <laughs> and... And trying to uh, figure out the intricacies of that, and uh, depending on the positioning of the participants, someone could get very, very cold. So, you know, it's it's interesting. Yeah. I, good, good call with those books. I'm definitely going to read all of them. Great. A significant portion of Canada can be classified as wilderness. This includes massive forests, mountains, lakes, rivers, tundra, and Arctic landscapes. Canada's national parks and protected areas cover approximately 328,198 square kilometers, preserving these wilderness areas. The Canadian boreal forest alone, which stretches across the country from Newfoundland and Labrador to the Yukon, covers about 55% of Canada's land area. Despite extensive mapping and surveying, some areas in Canada, particularly in the vast northern regions, have seen few or no human footprints. These areas might be technically known due to satellite imagery, but they remain largely untouched and unexplored on the ground. These sprawling landscapes naturally evoke a sense of mystery and wonder. 
Covering six time zones and home to some of the world's most diverse ecosystems, it's hardly surprising that such a vast land has given birth to many legends, especially those centered around cryptids and other enigmatic creatures. The lure of mysterious beings is deeply rooted in the traditions of Canada's indigenous peoples who have lived in harmony with the land for millennia. Their oral traditions are replete with tales of creatures and spirits from the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest, which we've covered, to the underwater serpents of the Great Lakes, as one traverses the country from the fog-laden coasts of the Maritime Provinces to the rainforests of British Columbia and from the prairies of Manitoba to the icy expanses of none of it, it becomes clear that each region, with its unique environment, has its own set of legends and tales. Historically, many parts of Canada remained isolated from the rest of the world, and this isolation, coupled with the challenges posed by a sometimes unforgiving climate, led to the emergence of tight-knit communities where stories and legends could be passed down and evolve over generations. The story of this episode's first creature is just one of those. The Coleman Frog a legend rooted in the town of Coleman, New Brunswick, stands as a testament to the region's rich folklore and the intriguing tales that small communities can harbor. The story begins in the late 19th century when Fred Coleman, a local of the area, stumbled upon a seemingly ordinary frog when it jumped into his boat while he was fishing on Killarney Lake just north of the provincial capital, Fredericton. Fred happily fed the friendly little frog a bit of his lunch, and then it jumped out of the boat back into the lake and disappeared beneath the water's surface. Fred returned numerous times to the same spot, and on each occasion the frog hopped back into the boat where it was fed and then hopped off again. This continued for some time until, on one occasion, the growing frog did not jump out of the boat after being fed. It seemed to want to hang around, so Fred took it home. Fred's newfound amphibian pal defied the norms of nature. Like a dog or cat, the frog would beg for food. Instead of barking or meowing, it would, of course, rib it. As the tale goes, the frog, whom Fred later named Big Tom, grew at an astonishing rate under his care. Tom preferred people food to the usual frog diet of bugs and such, and allegedly had an affinity for baked beans. That would have been a pretty farty frog. I think so. <laughs> well, Big Tom, can you imagine? I wonder what frogs' farts smell like. I know Steve's farts are terrible. Especially a 42-pound uh, frog. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I don't, like, amphibian. Do amphibians fart? Perhaps somebody who is a biologist can let us know. And because there is a TikTok or a podcast or something called Does It Fart? I think I, at least there's a book uh, called Does It Fart? <laughs> if there's somebody in the Yumber Yard that has an affinity for frogs, and she can probably tell us. Well, hopefully she'll listen to this episode yeah. and let us know. According to a blog post about the Coleman frog in an article from the 1890s, Fred Coleman claimed that a traveling American doctor, during his visit to Fredericton, mentioned to Mr. Coleman about a book he had in Massachusetts, which he had acquired in France. This book explained how to nurture oversized frogs. After his journey, he sent the book to Coleman, who used its knowledge to feed the frog an appropriate diet, aiding in its growth. Instead of the typical size one might expect from a frog, Big Tom expanded to a staggering weight of, as Matthew mentioned, 42 pounds, 19 kilograms, and stretched over 3.5 feet, 1 meter, in length. Typical bullfrogs only grow to 8 inches long. The official record weight for a bullfrog is 1 pound, 4 ounces, or just over half a kilogram, nowhere near the 42 pounds claimed of Big Tom. Fred developed a close bond with his remarkable frog, which often responded to Fred's calls or a dinner bell, delighting his guests. However, there were times when the frog displayed its shy nature, choosing not to appear when summoned. Still, many claim to have seen the frog during its lifetime. Word of this colossal creature quickly spread, transforming Coleman's residence into a hub of curiosity and wonder. People traveled from distant towns and perhaps even further, drawn by tales of the giant frog. They would visit Coleman's Inn, 
surprise, it's a business, not for its hospitality alone, but to catch a glimpse of Big Tom, the amphibian that had become a living legend. However, as with many tales of wonder, there's often a shadow of tragedy. The legend takes a somber turn with the untimely demise of Big Tom. Whispers and rumors suggest that an envious or fearful individual, unable to stomach the frog's growing fame, took it upon themselves to end Big Tom's life. Following a dynamite-related mishap that led to the Coleman Frog's death, Fred had Big Tom's remains preserved by a taxidermist in Bangor, Maine. Subsequently, it was showcased in a glass enclosure at his hotel in Fredericton, and thus became a tourist attraction. Uh, <laughs> Mike? Yes? What is a dynamite-related mishap? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the... A dynamite-related mishap <laughs> definitely uh, indicates there was some sort of explosion. <laughs> Unless, I don't know. What the heck was a frog doing close to dynamite? Well, I don't know. Maybe we'll leave it to our listeners to do some more research and <laughs> figure out what it was. And let us know what the exact <laughs> dynamite-related incident was. Poor Big Tom. <laughs> yeah. A photograph in the hotel's lobby captures the Coleman frog inside its display, revealing an authentic speckled skin contrasting with its current painted look, which many say indicates it's fake. Legend suggests that the protective glass was removed after Fred's death and tipsy hotel guests repurposed the frog as an ashtray. Before its eventual donation to the York Sunbury Museum in 1959, the frog underwent a restoration process resulting in its current uncharacteristic green hue so i was howling with laughter when i looked at the photo of the frog after the restoration right remember when that 82 year old woman i think her name was cecilia jimenez yeah attempted to restore a painting of jesus with a crown of thorns in her local church in in, in spain yeah and it just looked like this child's drawing and, and created a million fantastic memes. This restoration is kind of, if that was a, once a real frog, this is the equivalent of, of, of that. <laughs> yeah, they definitely made it look quite fake now. Yeah. But who knows? But is it fake? According to the Fredericton Region Museum website, quote, The Coleman frog was sent to the Canadian Conservation Institute in 1988 and underwent two years of conservation treatment. It was determined at that time that the taxidermy methods used on the frog were consistent with the late 19th century techniques. We are told that other authenticity tests came back inconclusive, end quote. So today, while the era of Big Tom has long passed, his legacy remains very much alive. What they claim is the real Big Tom can be viewed at the Fredericton Museum. So I will definitely check it out the next time I'm in town. I'm going to go into suspension of disbelief in order to participate in the fun. Okay. <laughs> and say that Big Tom was real. I would love to believe that Big Tom was real. It, but Big Tom definitely defies the rules of physics and biology and all of the other things that relate to reality. But hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe there was this crazy frog that was divergent, some weird thing, and, and because Big Tom never got the chance to reproduce, we don't see any more Big Toms. It could have been a, a branch of evolution that could have happened, but didn't. When I was first reading the notes on the script, I thought, oh, there's one way to find out, and that's to have it like properly DNA tested, like the one in the museum. Yeah. But then I was like, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's just leave it. Well, it just sort of brought to mind the recent uh, aliens that were presented as real in Mexican Congress. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. There's been so many memes about that. It's really, really funny. But anyway, that's that's for another show, actually. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get into that. Our next creature is one of the indigenous legends from here in British Columbia, and it's much more terrifying. The Kwakakiwak are indigenous peoples from northeastern Vancouver Island and mainland British Columbia. In 2016, 3,670 people identified as Kwakakiawak. Historically, they consisted of 28 communities speaking the Kwakawala language. 
and Europeans mistakenly named them Quakatule in 1849, but they're known for their cultural ceremonies like the potlatch and their distinct art, including totem poles. Let's dive into the world of art for a moment because okay. I am actually, you don't know this about me, I'm a huge enthusiast when it comes to Kakakiwak art and design. And there's so much more than totem poles. So I'm, I'm a newcomer here. Right, and mm -hmm. when I first got here, the, you're kind of you're kind of bombarded with Northwest Coast Indigenous art, and honestly, there's a lot of tourist trinkets. You know, there's cheesy mass-produced versions of historical treasures, like totem pole keychains and fridge magnets. It's a bit like when you go to Paris and, and there's poorly colored Mona Lisa reproductions on coffee mugs at every corner, right? But beneath all of that, you know, when you, we go to the real stuff, it's incredible artwork. Um, I think many European settlers dismissed um, First Nations art as as lowbrow or just native, right? And that's so, from my mind, it's so far from the truth. You know, of course, the, the Kakakiwak art is deeply rooted in culture and tradition and place. <laughs> But for me, it transcends that. It, it's almost universal uh, in that, you know, the aesthetic contemplation and stories of moral and spiritual significance is, is the definition of high art. And all the Kakakiwak art does that. And, and let's not forget, it's just plain beautiful. If anyone wants to look it up, it's, it's amazing because it's ancient, but it also looks, the lines are so contemporary at the same time. Speaking of contemporaries, I have one piece by an artist named Andy Everson, um, and he's one of my absolute favorites. He's, he, he has Kakakiwak lineage. It's, it's called Resistance, where he reimagines a Star Wars stormtrooper as a First Nations warrior. And he did this to draw parallels between the imperialism and occupation depicted in in the blockbuster films star wars um right uh, with the impact of british empire colonialism on indigenous communities in canada so yeah it's fascinating so it's this fun piece of art but it has so much relevance and story to it and he even mm -hmm. he, he even said like him him doing that was kind of a little act of resistance, right? Sure. Yep. And people who are listening might actually be familiar with his work without even realizing it. So he actually designed the Every Child Matters t-shirt that many folks across Canada now wear. And, and the cool thing is he intentionally didn't trademark it so it could be reproduced by anyone far and wide to, to get the important message out. Very cool. The Kwakakiwak people have been in the region for at least 8,000 years, traditionally relying on fishing, hunting, and gathering. The Kwakwala language is now endangered. They first met European explorers in the late 18th century and faced challenges like the potlatch ban in 1885. Today, they balance traditional practices with modern life and work towards preserving their culture and achieving self-government. Within the intricate web of Kwakakiwak mythology, and bear with me while I pronounce this, Baxback Wallanexwai emerges as a figure of profound significance, often called the cannibal of the north end of the world. The creature embodies the community's deep-rooted connection to nature, transformation, and the delicate balance between the civilized world and the wilderness. Central to this mythology, Baxback Wallanexwai is envisioned as a supernatural cannibal bird symbolizing the chilling embrace of winter and the north. Often portrayed with a distinctive elongated beak, this deity is intertwined with the onset of darkness and tempestuous storms representing nature's untamed and unpredictable elements. According to the site A Book of Creatures and Franz Boa's 1897 book, in the lore of the Kwakakiawak people, Baxback Wallanexawai stands as the most fearsome entity. His name has various interpretations, including that, as we mentioned before, cannibal at the north end of the world, but also he who first ate man at the mouth of the river. A gentler translation is, ever more perfect manifestation of the essence of humanity, though Maneater captures his essence more directly. This creature is pivotal to the mysterious Hamatsa, or cannibal ritual, which is a dance performed at potlatches to tell the fearsome deity's story. Visually, the creature is a terror to behold, bearing humanoid or bear-like features around four times larger than the average adult human. 
Its body is adorned with numerous open, bleeding mouths, each echoing the sound hap, 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 signifying eat, eat, eat. His dwelling is distinct, draped in red cedar bark, with a chimney emitting a crimson smoke. <laughs> you know what? I, I actually really love this little guy. Every time. When I think of Steve, my bulldog, when I was looking at this, it reminded me of him because when he's barking, I always imagine him just going, eat, 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 or treat, treat, treat. <laughs> the picture of this thing is horrendous. Like, this is quite a creepy looking creature with bare skin and mouths all over its body, including its back and legs and face. And Imagine being able to eat with your left foot. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really, really crazy but anyway i love this creature and it's horrifying yeah if that was coming at you, you you'd probably have a little piddle in your pants <laughs> definitely definitely something like that or you would you would at least make for your canoe <laughs> a cadre of malevolent beings surrounds back's back while an xy his consort kominaga draped in red and white cedar and his other servants serve him human delicacies one servant, the raven at the north end of the world, targets the eyes of its prey. Hawk's Hawk, a colossal crane, uses its elongated beak to shatter skulls and feast on the brains. Other terrifying bird-like creatures stand as sentinel as the monster gobbles his victims. These terrifying bird monsters are extensions of the main monster, acting as his sensory organs, ensuring nothing escapes their notice. In one tale... A skilled shaman encountered the creature while on a mountain hunt. Captured by Komanaga, who beckoned the monster to consume him, the shaman narrowly escaped and, out of terror, lost all his hair in the process. A chase ensued through the woodlands and caverns, culminating in the shaman outwitting Bax Bax Wallen XY by trapping him in a pit. Both the monster and Komanaga met their fiery end in the pit, and when the shaman blew on their remains, they transformed into the world's voracious mosquitoes. So I guess we have that guy to blame. Today, they and their offspring soar through the air, continuously nourishing themselves with the blood and flesh of humanity. Despite their physical transformation into mosquitoes, the monster and his minions can still assume spiritual form. The Hamatsa ritual, as performed by the Kwakakiawak people, narrates the story of Baxback Wallen XY's possession of a youngster, driving him into a wild state where he mimics the creature's characteristic sounds and actions. The ceremony culminates in a symbolic purification and initiation of the possessed into the community. The ritual is visually enriched by dancers donning intricately designed masks representing the creature and his associates. More after a quick break, but first... Here's the promo for Supernatural Circumstances. Hey Dark Poutine listeners, Mike here. Are you ready to dive deep into the mysteries of the supernatural? Join me and award-winning paranormal researcher Morgan Knudsen as we dissect chilling phenomena on Supernatural Circumstances. From spine-tingling hauntings to creepy cryptids and other paranormal subjects, we'll be your guides on this extraordinary journey. We're in Season 2 right now, so there are plenty of episodes for you to catch up on. Buckle up and explore the unknown with us and numerous expert guests. Download Supernatural Circumstances wherever you podcast. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts on this episode so far? I think you've done a great job on this episode because it's sort of like we're taking a, a journey through the natural history of the gods in Canada, Yep. right? Um, the stories that humans in Canada have crafted to sort of unravel life's mysteries or provide guidance or to issue warnings, right? Mm -hmm. My BFF Murr um, always says... Um, to me that Joseph Campbell is my homeboy because I'm always referencing him. Uh, right. <laughs> so so he um, dedicated his life to the study of, of and teaching myths and cross-cultural mythology. And he kind of unveiled a fascinating truth in his books. And that is that often in the stories of mythological beings from cultures that have had no contact with each other, you find similar tales, similar creatures, similar characters. Mm -hmm. and, and his summary was it's, 
it's humanity's way of making sense of our own existence. So before you get into the next thing, Joseph Campbell's book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, was apparently inspiration for George Lucas yeah. while writing Star Wars. So he took some classical uh, ideas and mythological concepts to make Star Wars such a relatable thing. They, they actually knew each other. They were they were friends. Mm. There's a great interview with George Lucas about that, actually, on Netflix or something. Cool. We have ancient myths deeply woven into our cultures, right, here in Canada. Mm -hmm. First Nations one, but also the stories of the virgin birth from the Bible, for example, right? The Bible isn't the only place that has that virgin birth. There's actually older stories that tell that same story, which is interesting. Absolutely. And Campbell pointed out that this notion of a virgin birth has appeared over and over and over again in so many cultures, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just in the Bible. It was eons before the Bible that, that this story was told. Right. And he talks about how this sort of storytelling isn't literal. And he's why? Because it holds actually profound meanings for people. So he kind of put it this way. He said, the virgin birth has nothing to do with a biological accident. It symbolizes instead the awakening of spiritual life in the human animal. It's a mythic symbol. It should not be read finally as historical fact. All mythology is misread when it is read as referring to historical events or geographical places. The promised land is not a piece of land to be conquered by military might. It is a condition of the heart. I love that line. This is 100% what I believe, yep. And so these stories we're sharing, you know, these spooktober stories, they're, they're a whole lot of fun, mm -hmm. but they're incredibly meaningful in a lot of ways. They carry cust wisdom and insights that have resonated across time. I agree, and that is why I'm so fascinated with them, because there's always something to learn. Yeah. When French settlers came to Canada, they brought with them their beliefs and tales, including those of the Lutin. Lutin is a term rooted in French folklore, referring to a type of mischievous spirit or fairy. In Canadian folklore, particularly the French-speaking regions like Quebec, the Lutin has a presence similar to its European counterpart, but has also taken on characteristics unique to the Canadian context. A mischievous fairy sounds like me. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that, Matthew. <laughs> the Luton is often likened to the Irish leprechaun or the English puck. They are known to be playful and mischievous, often playing tricks on humans. For instance, they might hide objects, tangle horses' manes, or even pinch people while they sleep. However, they can also be helpful, especially if treated with respect or appeased with offerings. One of the most well-known Luton in Quebec folklore is the Bonhomme Septeur, the Seven O'Clock Man. The Bonhomme Septeur is a chilling figure deeply rooted in the folklore of Quebec. This spectral entity serves as a dark reminder for children to be home before sunset. As the tales go, once the clock strikes seven in the evening, the Bonhomme Septeur emerges from the shadows, wandering the streets and alleys, searching for any child who has disobeyed the curfew. Those unfortunate enough to cross its path are said to be snatched up. In a particularly macabre twist, he carries with him a sack filled with bones. He uses this to strike the feet of the children he captures, crippling them so they can never run home again. The story of the Bonhomme Septeur is more than just a simple ghost story. It reflects Quebec's cultural and environmental realities. In the province's more northern location, night falls early and lingers during winter, with temperatures dropping to bone-chilling lows. In such conditions, it would be dangerous for children to be outside, especially without supervision. Thus, the tale likely originated as a protective measure for parents to instill a sense of caution in their children about the dangers of the night, both real and imagined. Over time, the legend has been passed down through generations, evolving and adapting, but always retaining its core message. Some versions even suggest that the Bonhomme Septeur was once a kind-hearted man who suffered a tragic fate, leading him to become the vengeful spirit he is today. Regardless of its variations, the tale remains a staple of Quebec's tapestry of folklore, a haunting reminder of the mysteries and dangers that the night can hold. Ah, I was wondering why he was called Bonhomme, because that roughly translates to good guy or good-natured man. Mm-hmm. 
But there, there's the lesson, right? Even if you're a good person, you can suffer a tragic event that will change you for the worse. Right. That's sort of the lesson for these children, right? Or just don't go out after dark because something will get you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a tragic event that could change you for the worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I had one of those. Exactly. Anyway. The legend of Bonhomme Septur has been forgotten in many regions, but the expression remains widespread. The Bonhomme Septur appeared as an antagonist to Jack Frost and his friends in the animated film The Guardians in 2012. He aimed to turn children's dreams, hopes, and wishes into fear and nightmares. The term is also used in the movie John Wick to refer to the main character, played by Keanu Reeves. Terms like croque mitten and père futard are relatively unknown in Canada, unlike bonhomme septeur. The croque mitaine, often translated as boogeyman in English, is a mythical creature prevalent in many cultures, used by adults to frighten children into good behavior. The term croque mitaine is of French origin and can be broken down into croque from the verb croqueur, which means to bite or to crunch, and mitaine, which means mitten. Thus, the literal translation might suggest a creature that bites mittens or eats hands, but the term is more broadly understood as a general monster or boogeyman figure. In French folklore and popular culture, the croque mitaine is often depicted as a man or creature hiding under beds or in closets, waiting to snatch up and eat misbehaving children. The specifics of the creature's appearance and its habits can vary widely from one region or from one family to another. Still, the general idea remains consistent. Terrifying figure, encouraging children to behave, go to bed on time, or avoid certain places like the cookie jar, for example, when mom's not around. Oh. Hey, hey, Mike, when I was a kid, I absolutely had to have my mom close my closet door completely so that mm -hmm. so that no, in my head, it was so no monsters inside could like peek through the crack and see me. Did you do the same thing? I had exactly the same thing. It wasn't my mom who would close the door. I would do it myself just to make sure it was done correctly. And <laughs> I'm not a control freak, never have been. Uh, and also, if, for the horror of it, I had to pee in the middle of the night, I didn't just slowly put my feet down out of the bed. I would essentially leap <laughs> away from the bed so something that was under the bed would not be able to grab me. I would make sure I leapt far enough that I was out of arm's reach. And your dad's like, well, the hell are you doing in there? <laughs> no, we, our house was big enough. They never knew that I was doing that. <laughs> Père Futard, whose name translates to Father Whipper or Old Man Whipper, is a character from European folklore particularly associated with French and Belgian Christmas traditions. He's often depicted as a sinister man who accompanies St. Nicholas and punishes naughty children by whipping them, unlike St. Nicholas, who rewards the well-behaved ones. In the legend, Père Futard was originally an innkeeper, or sometimes a butcher, who, along with his wife, lured three boys into his inn, where they were robbed and murdered. Saint Nicholas miraculously resurrected the boys and took Père Futard captive. The wicked man repented and became Saint Nicholas's partner, serving as a warning and deterrent to misbehaving children. Jeepers creepers! Wow, kids have it easy these days. If, if you're on the naughty list, you just don't get a gift or a lump of coal. But back then, you could get whipped. Or lured to an inn and murdered and robbed. <laughs> I'm, Holy t I'm telling you, kids have it easy these days. <laughs> <laughs> kids have it super easy. In Canada, particularly in Quebec, with its strong French influence, St. Nicholas and Père Futard are not as central to Christmas celebrations as they are in Europe. However, some are familiar with the legend due to the cultural ties and the presence of French communities. The primary Christmas figure in Canada remains Santa Claus, known as Père Noël in French-speaking regions. Still, Père Futard's story might be known among those with a strong connection to French traditions or those who have been exposed to European customs. Our final segment takes us all the way north near the Arctic Circle, where we'll learn about a few legends of the Inuit people. Some of these are downright terrifying. In the vast, icy expanse of the Arctic, a legend has been whispered among the Inuit for generations. 
the tail of Mahaha. With its slender form and a hue reminiscent of the deepest glaciers, this spectral being is a paradox of the Arctic's serene beauty and deadly nature. Its cold and unyielding skin mirrors the frozen tundra, and its hair, wild and untamed, flows like the northern lights, but hides its eerily pale eyes that seem to pierce the soul. But what's most unsettling is Mahaha's perpetual, almost mocking giggle, which echoes hauntingly across the icy plains. This sound, often the only warning of its approach, is a chilling reminder of its cruel intentions. Despite its almost skeletal appearance, Mahaha possesses a strength that belies its frame. Its bare feet, impervious to the biting cold, leave behind no trace, making it an elusive predator. Mahaha's method of dispatching its victims is as unique as it is terrifying. Instead of a swift end, it uses its elongated fingers tipped with razor-sharp nails to tickle its prey to death, a macabre dance of laughter and fear. The aftermath is always the same. Victims are found with an with eerie victims are found with eerie frozen smiles, a grim testament their a grim testament to their final moments. Now, this is interesting. So, you know, when somebody's grappling with hypothermia, Mm -hmm. there's this sort of strange and tragic phenomenon that towards the end, they often experience a bizarre sensation of feeling incredibly hot to the point where they want to shed their clothes. Right. And they get this overwhelming urge to lie down and drift off, and which is accompanied by an odd sense of well-being. Right. Strangely enough, they often even smile when this is happening, and, and the smile tends to stay on their face when they freeze. Yeah. So maybe this myth is how people dealt with this weird sort of enigmatic smile on dead people they found that had frozen to death. It's really interesting how, you know, you have it written here. It's a reminder of how our stories and myths often emerge as attempts to comprehend the inexplicable aspects of the human experience. I love that. Yeah. That is what I think these things might be as well. Yeah. Every legend has its weaknesses, and Mahaha is no exception. For all its cunning and power, it possesses a surprising naivety. Time and again, tales have emerged of its victims outwitting it. The most common ruse involves the very element the Arctic is known for, water. By luring the creature to the edge of a water hole under some pretense, often a shared drink, the quick-thinking individual pushes Mahaha into the icy depths where the swift currents carry it away, at least for a time. Another species of odd Arctic creature, Qualupaluk, are enigmatic aquatic entities that dwell in the frigid depths of the Arctic waters. Their appearance is distinctive, with skin resembling the coarse texture of a sculpin and often associated with a strong, unmistakable scent of sulfur. This combination of features makes them a subject of fascination and fear among those who have heard tales of their existence. These creatures, are particularly notorious for their unsettling penchant for kidnapping children. The reasons behind this behavior are shrouded in mystery. Some speculate that the Qualipaluk, perhaps being solitary creatures, yearn for companionship and find solace in the innocent presence of children. Others suggest a more sinister motive, hinting that these beings might have developed a taste for young flesh. In many legends, the Qualipaluk are described as donning clothing crafted from duck feathers. This attire is not just for protection against the cold, but also features large pouches or sacks specifically designed to transport their young captives. They are master ambush predators, often lurking just below the water's surface, patiently waiting for unsuspecting children playing alone on the beach or near the fragile edges of ice sheets. While their attacks are often sudden and without warning, there are occasional signs of their presence. A faint knocking sound emanating from beneath the ice is one such indicator. Elders, who have passed down tales of the Qualipaluk through generations, often caution that unusual disturbances in the water, such as unexpected waves or mysterious steam, might be a sign that one of these creatures is lurking below. 
The tales of the Qualipaluk serve as a stark reminder of the dangers that might be hidden just out of sight. The message is clear. The Arctic waters hold mysteries, and it's always safer for children to play away from its unpredictable edges. Another creature, the Inupasagyuk, often whispered about in hushed tones among the northern communities, are towering giants that roam the vast icy landscapes of the north. While sightings are rare, the tales suggest that these beings possess an imposing stature that dwarfs even the tallest humans. Male Inupasagyuk are described as being larger and more intimidating, and they are even a rarer sight. Their elusive nature has led to numerous speculations. Their scarcity in tales and sightings might be because those who encounter them never return to share their stories, hinting at a more sinister nature. In contrast, female Inapasagyuk are slightly more familiar figures in folklore. With a curious fascination for humans, they are known to capture them, not out of malice, but out of amusement. They treat these captured humans as toys or playthings, a behavior that has led to many cautionary tales. Elders often recount stories of these giantesses whisking people away, carrying them in their amutiks, which are traditional Inuit women's parkas. Despite their daunting presence, there are ways to evade these giants. Local wisdom suggests that if one ever finds themselves in the presence of an Inupasagyuk, the best course of action is to become as inconspicuous as possible. Crouching down and remaining utterly still is typically the best course of action. The vast and desolate landscapes of the north can be both an ally and an enemy, but in this case, it's the best camouflage against these curious, not always kind giants. Though not really scary, the Tunit are often considered the predecessors of the Inuit in northern regions, have long been a subject of intrigue and speculation. Their distinct culture, language, and artifacts scattered across the north provide a tantalizing glimpse into a society that once thrived in these harsh environments. While seemingly rudimentary, their language, known as Kutak, might have been perfectly adapted to their specific needs and environment, emphasizing the importance of communication tailored to their way of life. Physically, the Tunit were not taller than the average human we know today, but their robust build and remarkable strength set them apart. This physical prowess, combined with their traditional attire, made from animal hides and their reliance on ancient tools, paints a picture of a people deeply in tune with their environment, using every resource available to them for survival. Imagine running into such an individual in the vast northern landscapes, their attire and tools reminiscent of past eras. Such an encounter would be like stepping back in time, offering a rare glimpse into an ancient way of life. And if they were to speak, their simple yet profound words would be a testament to their unique linguistic heritage. The more we delve into the history and characteristics of the Tunit, the more we are drawn to the possibility they might have been a separate hominid species. Could they have been a branch of humanity that evolved parallel to but distinct from modern humans and maybe even Neanderthals? Their unique physical and cultural traits could indicate different evolutionary trajectory. This hypothesis, while speculative, opens up a world of possibilities for researchers. Were there interactions between the Tunit and other ancient human species? What might the societal structures, beliefs, and rituals have looked like? The Tunit, with its rich history and enigmatic presence, beckons us to explore these questions and uncover the mysteries of our shared human past. I really like this story in a few ways. One, uh, the the idea that there's another hominoid species that they were running into is really cool. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't really believe this, but it's, it's sort of like, I want to believe. Yeah. The idea that deep down in our psyches... We are connected to the past to, to the point where we can see people that previously existed. Maybe. Yeah. Like, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. There is more to be revealed, I think, in all of this. We don't know everything that there is to know. Remember these tales next time you find yourself wandering the Canadian wilderness or sitting by a campfire under the northern stars or even going to bed in a darkened bedroom. And who knows? You may have your own encounter with one of Canada's legendary creatures. Like Steve. <laughs> like Steve. Or or Big Tom the Farty Frog. Or Big frog. Tom the Farty Frog. Big Steve the Farty Bulldog. <laughs>
<laughs> oh dear. Oh, that was such a fun episode. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 327 darkptn We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So it's the first time I've played that little jingle for Matthew because you don't listen to the show. <laughs> so you, you won't ever hear that. But yeah, I've been playing that open to the voicemails for quite some time. I know. It, it's so sad that... Um... I, I don't like listening to my own voice, which means I can't listen to my favorite podcast anymore. <laughs> I could potentially just cut the podcast together as just the story and release it on Patreon for people and share it with no. you. If you just <laughs> if you want to hear the story. <laughs> no, I know the story because I we read it together. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Anyway, it's fun. Uh but let's listen to our first voicemail. This sounds like somebody who uh wants to talk to us about the HIV episode uh, that we did. So we'll have a listen. Hey, uh, Mike and uh, Matthew. It's Chris from Connecticut. And I, I enjoyed the show about the HIV, uh, telling your partners how much of a crime it can be. It got me thinking about Randy Schilt's uh, book in the band played on. He accused French Canadian Gaetan Dugas of being patient zero in the USA. History has shown that he wasn't the first HIV person in the U.S. And that before 83, having unprotected sex with a lot of people wasn't considered that bad. Just a little side note. Thanks. Bye. Well, thank you very much. That, you know, I that book the band played on is on my Audible wish list because I want to learn more about that. Like, sometimes when we do these stories, uh, I we put it into an hour-long episode, but there's so much more to learn about this stuff. And, and so, essentially, I go away and I learn even more about these things. And I hope you folks are doing it, too. Um, all our shows are meant to be, you know, an introduction. We don't do any real deep dives. There may be some coming up soon, uh, but but not right now. <laughs> anyway, what do you think about patient zero and that kind of thing, Matthew? I have zero patience for the idea of patient zero. Right. Patient zero was an urban legend that was, actually was kind of solidified in, in North America because of the band played on. Uh, but yep. there's actually, before you read that or watch that, try giving Zero Patience a watch. It's a musical film written by John Grayson that refutes refutes okay. this urban legend. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. I will. Yeah, because I like to have all sides of a story. I don't know about sides, but I like to have uh, different perspectives on stories when I, especially things that are quote unquote factual. Yeah. Like, for example, Making a Murderer. Apparently there's new documentary uh, that's just called Convicting a Murderer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, who knows? Anyway, uh, but good voicemail. What do you think Trish does there in Connecticut? Connecticut. <laughs> okay, so Chris li lives in Crimson Peak, Connecticut. Okay. And it, it's a towering mountain peak that has rich yep. red hues. Uh, okay. Uh, that stands as sort of a challenge to adventurous climbers. And um, there's uh, the Crimson Yeti is from there. Uh, oh, a rare cool. and elusive creature said to inhabit the, the peaks, icy caves. And Trish gives tours of those caves and, and hopes of, of seeing the Crimson Yeti. That is really fun. Yeah. I love that it's idea. A, it's I love that. a good that. job, isn't it? Thank you. It is a good Trish, job. thank you for climbing those mountains and uh, trying to help find that cryptid. Yeah. Weren't sure of your name because we it, it, it didn't kind of cut off at the beginning. So I'm not sure if it was Chris yeah. or Trish, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, whoever you are, thank you <laughs> for your voicemail. Uh, next up, uh, let's listen to this one. Not sure what this is about. Hi, Mike and Matt. Uh, 
My name's Dave. I'm from Alberta. And uh, sorry, my lawyer is being a little loud right now. But so um, I just got to say to my hi to my girlfriend Caitlin, who brought me into this show. Um, yeah, I guess you guys are acquaintances too, because uh, you guess you know her auntie or something like that, and she got a picture from me during COVID. Anyways, I digress. Um, I I I usually wait over the winter time so I can have all your episodes in the summer and I just listened to that episode about Travis Vader. Now it's funny because uh, I just listened to it and I work at an asphalt plant and uh, anyways like sitting around talking with all the guys at work and I go yeah remember, remember that Travis Vader guy from Edson like you know what a piece of shit that guy was eh and one of the guys that I work with I'm not going to say his name just to kind of protect him or whatever he goes yeah that's of my son-in-law. Goes, oh, you're kidding me. He goes, yeah, my daughter was married to him. I go, holy shit, hey? Eh? It's a small world out there. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't believe it. What a piece of garbage that guy is. So, anyways, I love the content. Keep it up. Uh, yeah. Hi, Caitlin. Miss you. Love you. I'll be home soon. <laughs> anyways, yeah. Uh, go shit in your hat, piss up a rope, and uh, keep your stick on the ice. Better, guys. Bye. <laughs> Fantastic! Oh we got a whole we got a whole bunch of different things to do. Love there. that! Love that! <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what did he say he was doing? So it said some something was making. Was it a moan? No, Ash. What? Yeah. Well, I thought he said lawyer. That his lawyer was making a lot of noise, but but yeah. I don't think it was a lawyer. Something was going on there. But but right. he 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 he. Uh, there's an Alberta and works in asphalt, right? Yeah. Um, yep. So I I think he works in the the asphalt abyss. Okay. And, well, and so so we know what he does. But what's interesting is he keeps an eye out for uh, the asphalt shadow, which is a cryptid that appears uh, as a shadowy, oh, wow. amorphous figure that roams the asphalt abyss. And it's it, it's okay. said to have the ability to melt into the road itself, becoming one with the ashen surface. And witnesses describe it as a sentient living darkness that emerges during the darkest hours of night from the roads. It sounds like the bathroom for me. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so, so, uh, yeah, keep, keep a watch out for that. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, we've got another, we've got two more voicemails. Let's listen to this one. Hey, Scotty Mac calling in uh, northern Saskatchewan. Um, a while back, I was listening to your podcast on the Boucher case. And, uh, yeah, Mike, you, you mentioned that, oh, they're, they're so close to the police station. They would have been there in minutes. Unfortunately, living in the north is not like um, living in big city centers, you know. I, I live remote. I live in the north. And my teacherage, you know, where a uh, place where teachers live, is right near the RCMP depot. Or no, not depot, but you know, RCMP, you know, the cop shop. Anyways, uh, I had a couple of run-ins where my my place is being broken into. Camera went off, and you notify the cops. And you think the cops being right there, right across the street from where you live. Guess what? They show up over an hour later. Uh, my truck was stolen, and I called it in, and it, they didn't get around, you know, dealing with it because they were so backlogged. So, you know, it, it's tough when you live remote and you call for nine one one for help, and police response is, it, you know, it's that time consuming. So it's not as as prompt as you might think. Anyways, uh, love your um, podcast. And uh, keep on rocking the free world, and of course, take a shit in your hat. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, I've got a story about the RCMP as well, which is an interesting sort of, and it it aligns with what you're saying. Um, yeah, I've I've actually had to call the cops recently for a situation in a, a neighboring apartment where. Somebody was screaming, call me an ambulance. It's broken. It's broken. And the person was mumbling at her. It was really horrific, whatever was going on. But rather than go get involved myself, I called 911 for them. 
Anyway, anyway, uh, but I don't know if they ever came, whatever. It was on another floor, all that kind of thing. Uh, but I have had RCMP take a while to respond. As a kid, we used to ring the bell of one of the churches. Uh, the, the, the rope for the bell was hanging outside the church, so somebody outside would have to ring the bell every Sunday. So as children, we thought, well, let's ring the bell as many times as we can before someone comes. And we would do this at night. We called it yelching. I don't know why we called it that, but we called it yelching. And uh, funnily enough, the United Church was directly across the street from the RCMP detachment at the time in, in my hometown. Granted, we did have town police, but the RCMP were there also. Never did the RCMP respond. <laughs> Even if there were cars there, they did not respond. It was just like, oh, well. And, like, the staff sergeant lived in this particular detachment. So, you know, yeah. I don't know. I have my own opinions about the RCMP and community policing, but (laughs) uh, there is proof that maybe they just, you know, they've got bigger fish to fry. (laughs) Should be called 9-1 whenever. Yeah. (laughs) 9 1 whenever. Yeah. But uh, Matthew, uh, what does this person do in Saskatchewan? Uh, I think um, they live in Serenity Springs. Okay. And they're a teacher. Right. And, but Serenity, so I'm staying with the cryptid theme here today. Well, don't tell people that. Just do it. I. <laughs> First rule of radio broadcasting. Yeah, it's like, keep the mystery going, Matthew. Jeez. He captures aquatic nymphs. Oh. So the water spirits that that reside in the springs, and they sort of glow, and he puts them on the shelf at the school so for kids to look at. Yeah. I used to go to the swimming pool when I was a youngster and look at the aquatic nymphs, but... Uh, oh, God. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Well, good. Somebody's going to do that kind of stuff. So that's it for voicemail. Guess what, Matthew? What? I have a voicemail out as well as that fun jingle. How long has this been going on? For a long time. Oh, fun. Yeah, let me hear it. (laughs) That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARKPTN. We'd love to hear from you even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All righty, let's move on to Patreon and Donut Money donors. Uh, We don't have any patrons this week, not new ones. We do have our patrons who've stuck with us for quite some time, so thank you for that. But we do have a Donut Money donor, and her name is Tammy Kravitt. Tammy says, enjoy some donuts on me. Maybe give Steve, get Steve a treat, too. P.S. Have you considered doing an episode about the case of Stephen Truscott? My mom was born in Clinton, Ontario, so that case has always fascinated me. I'm a longtime listener and a yumber yarder, originally from Toronto, but now living in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, yes, I have considered doing Stephen Truscott. In fact, I've been reading a book about Stephen Truscott in preparation for that particular episode, I didn't want to. I didn't want to do too many uh, wrongful conviction ones uh, in a row, so I'm putting you know some space between those. But but definitely, we are going to do a Stephen Truscott episode at some point. So thank you for your donut money donation. But okay, from Toronto, now living in Pahoenix, Arizona, Pahoenix. Um, so what does Tammy do there in Phoenix, Matthew? Oh, I see what you were doing there, Pahoenix. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> it took me a second. Yeah. I'm like, she says she is from Phoenix. It's me intentionally mispronouncing something. <laughs> so she moved there specifically because she's a specialist. So she lives actually in an area of Phoenix called Phoenix Hollow. Mm-hmm. Which sort of is is deep in in a, in, a, in the the dense forests of Phoenix, and um, there are dense forests in Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and <laughs> and uh, she's a specialist in the Phoenix owl bear. What the heck is that? Yeah, so you know people think you know Phoenix, but there's a Phoenix owl bear, which is a legendary and mysterious creature that lives exclusively in Phoenix Hollow. 
and it's known for its a striking appearance combining the features of an owl and a bear with a unique fiery twist. So she, she's a Phoenix Owlbear specialist, so she, she moved to Phoenix Hollow specifically to keep studying it. Well, somebody's got to do it. Yep. Thank you to our patrons and Donut Money donors. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. That is it for this episode of Dark Poutine. Tune in next time for another Spooktober episode. There are four more, folks. So, yeah, exactly. Anyway, (laughs) and maybe there will be some in the next one. Yeah. Until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. And don't throw apples at people who hand them to you at Halloween. No. Throw them into the street. Smash them in the street (laughs) instead. That's what we used to do. Anyway, thanks, folks. Bye. Bye.